Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's virtual bison program. My name is Kylie Warren. I am a media specialist, and uh, I've captured this footage for you here tonight. And I have Timothy Smith and Josh Weezy here, and they're going to take a few minutes to introduce do, ah, introduce themselves. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, while uh, they jump on to do that, if you want to tell us where you're watching from, we would greatly appreciate it. Just chime so in the comments. We'd love to hear where our viewers are coming from. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and we have a lot to get going on with. So uh, without further ado, here is Tim and Josh. Hello everybody, this is Tim Smith, the Director of Land Management. Um, I'm here to walk you through some of tonight's footage and if you have any questions be sure to let us know in the comments. And I'm Josh Weesey, the Range Manager here at the Trust. Um, I kind of help out with uh, bison data collection and have written the bison management plan. Uh, for our herd um, along with Tim Smith and the rest of the Crane Trust team. Again, I'm happy to answer um, any questions about bison throughout the night and we'll help uh, talk you guys through some of the topics uh, for tonight's presentation. Thank you, Tim and Josh. We greatly appreciate you guys being here tonight. Uh, they are a very important part of our team and they work very hard to keep our bison thriving and healthy. Uh, a little bit about this program tonight. Uh, please let us know if you have uh, any familiarity at all with our crane season programming. Uh, that's our virtual tour of our crane roosts. Uh, this tour is slightly different. Ordinarily, when we are dealing with our crane season, we are feeding you live footage from our beautiful river cameras. This is river camera two. And this is river camera one. Uh, the challenge with uh, bringing you live bison footage is that bison move quite a bit across the range throughout the day. So it, it's difficult to anticipate where to set up a camera so we can easily capture them for you and bring you to breathe them to you in a live setting. So what we have done instead is we've gone out into the field. Uh, for example, last night we went out uh, and worked with a variety of lenses to capture this footage in advance in order to bring you a sort of uh, virtual experience that mirrors what we're doing with crane season. However, it is all pre-recorded footage. Uh, with that challenge, uh, the editing has been very quick, so there will be, just like with crane season, a little disruption in some of the footage, but we hope you don't mind, and we hope you enjoy this pre-captured footage with our uh, live audio commentary. We also invite you to uh, bring forth your questions. If you have any questions at all about bison or other habitat, uh, we will uh, hopefully be able to answer them for you with our experts here on the line. Later in the program, we will also show you some of the other um, things in nature that have been happening around the Crane Trust, and we will close with some beautiful bison sunset footage. Thank you again for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over to Josh and Tim to keep us rolling. The bison in this footage are currently in our Rugi Prairie. The bison have approximately 1,200 acres to roam, and we 
rotate them through different pastures or prairies throughout the growing season and throughout the year uh, to manage the growth of and create diversity across the landscape and our vegetation. Uh, these animals not only are very beautiful to look at, they're also a very useful tool that we use here to trust to maintain and manage our prairies. So this is Josh here, and a lot of people might ask why we don't just use cattle everywhere. Um, and really, uh, you know, grasslands evolved under the disturbance of bison. Um, it evolved th with their movements um, and their patterns of grazing um, and their activity places and where they like to spend their time and loaf. Um, with that, they've created a patchwork of different disturbance types um, throughout the prairie. And really what we're seeing on the landscape is that bison are grazing differently than cattle. There's some distinct differences between bison and cattle um, that we're seeing. Some of it's in diet, some of it's where they spend their time, some of it's in movement, um, and some of it's in relation to how they're using water. And we'll get into talking about some of those things tonight. We're often asked about calving season. Typically, we start calving in early April through May. Sometimes we have some late bloomers that come on, join us in June, but most of the calving is done in May, starting in April. Uh, it's a fun time for us. It's new life on the prairie. They're fun to watch. You can see some calves in the footage. Now, we currently have 42 calves in this year's.
correction, we have 43 calves this year. We had one of the late calves uh, about 10 days ago. So the reason that bison kind of synchronously have their calves and the reason they have them at that time is the, the theory is that that's when grasses put on their most nutrients. So the younger, fleshier grasses um, and the spring grasses tend to be higher in nutrient content and protein. Um, therefore, as they um, you know begin to suckle and begin to experiment with grasses, they're getting those high nutrients right away. So therefore, the natural cycle for them to um, to calve out is um, is that time when the the uh, forage is most nutritious. So we have a couple of our first questions rolling in. So the first one is asking about how to tell uh, male and females apart. And yes, it's true that you can tell them apart by their horn shape. Um, the female bison will have kind of recurved horns where they both start to point inwards towards each other in sort of a halo, um, creating sort of a halo effect where the bulls will have horns that usually grow out and then up. Um, the reason for that is that bulls use their horns for fighting one another, um, where females' horns are designed for defense. Um, and that's the easiest way to tell them apart, other than uh, adult size. So male adult bison can be quite um, a bit larger, almost twice the size of a female adult bison. Then Kate had a question here. Uh, she, she says, in a herd of 150, they had 43 calves. So 150, um, or a, a little bit over that actually, is our carrying capacity. So what we do is we have and about 114 adult bison, um, and that allows them to, uh, allows us to have room and grazing AUM, so that's animal, or animal unit, uh, animal unit month, you. So that's basically uh, how we compute our stocking rate. So how many animals are we going to have on how many acres for how long? And um, we leave room for the calves in that number because as they hit about the nine month mark, we actually consider them um, grazing about as much as an adult bison. And we keep our calves for um, till they're almost two years old and they've done um, they've weaned from their mothers naturally, so um, we will um, keep them for that long so that, uh, that we can keep their so social structure more intact and cause less stress on the baby bison. Thank you both so much for all that really amazing information. Um, one of the cool things that we do here at Crane Trust is uh, the bison get worked. Uh, every year uh, they go through a sort of health check. I'm going to let Tim jump on and talk a little bit about this while we show you some footage we captured um, last winter, last December. So here's Tim and here is some working bison footage.
so just to start off a little bit about working our animals uh, our number one priority for people and animals is safety above everything else we implement low stress handling the best we can and we work these animals through a system of pins that they naturally want to flow through by a series of gates opening it keeps the animals moving forward and through in a safe manner uh, we apply light pressure when needed but we try to let the animals make the decision for themselves when to go and where to go it can be a lot with this many animals working through the system but our main objective is to gather information needed for our herd especially with our genetics so as calves come are born here on the property they come through the system and we collect hair samples to send in for DNA sampling this allows us to see where their genetics are coming from what genetics are lacking as far as creating a more diverse genetic herd we we try to work our animals every de the first week of December uh, we feel that this is a good time due to outside air temperatures it's not too hot for the animals much less stressful for them to uh, if they have heightened anxiety in cooler weather when it's not so hot you can see Matt using what we call a rattle paddle um, it's one way to apply pressure without yelling it's just a paddle that's not only a visual for them but when you shake it it makes a noise that they try to get away from so it keeps them moving forward through through the system right here you can see a calf in our uh, Sorry, I may have been speaking to the wrong footage, but the, the whole premise is to get these animals through as quickly and efficiently as we can. Not only do we collect hair samples, sometimes we do collect fecal samples, as you saw Josh uh, collecting, and we can get a diet from that. Um, we have sent samples in to get uh, uh, see what they're eating through their uh, fecal samples, and we can also test for parasites that they may have. Uh, this is Josh again, and as I mentioned, I'm kind of helping out with a lot of the uh, science side of uh, our bison herd. Um, so not only are they helping us manage the landscape, but they're helping us learn a lot about bison. Um, and through this working is kind of our time, like Tim said, to collect data. Um, as you saw me collecting some of that poop, we uh, studied uh, the uh, bee parasites that bison are infected with and studied them in a control um, environment where some were getting treated and some weren't and then studied also how age might affect um, their parasite loads and what we found is that um, regardless of ever being treated for parasites that bison tended to have high um, numbers of parasites in the first two years but then by um, age three dramatically reduced their parasite load and as an adaptive place when, uh, as, as practicing adaptive management we 
want to take that good information and apply it somewhere. And so what we did was we actually um, eliminated treating parasites from our um, from our management plan for this bison, these bison and let them develop natural immunities. Um, and what that does is not only are they developing those immunities by themselves, they're becoming a more resilient species as a whole as they their genetics are proving to be able to handle those parasite loads and their body um, is being able to take care of those. Um, but we're also reducing the risk of a parasitic um, drug uh, resistance. So as we use drugs more and more, that um, these parasites become resistant um, over time and um, we're reducing the risk of that happening. So now the question is, is those one and two year old bison, do they suffer some sort of risk by having higher parasite loads than others? And so what we're doing now is as we work our bison, we're really checking those one and two year olds and then taking a weight as well um, to compare if bison that have higher parasite loads, if they have a higher weight or a lower weight. Um, and then we can further refine our management practices um, to fit with that new data. So as we watch these bison in this watering hole, um, so this this watering spot is um, not a natural feature on the landscape. It was dredged out at one point. Um, however, uh, the bison really like to spend time here, especially when the days are really hot. Um, but they actually have access to another watering spot on the pasture. Um, it's further in the horizon, um, not quite visible by um, in the video. Um, however, so uh, when I mentioned that bison and cattle have distinct differences, one of them is their use of water. Um, bison traditionally spend less time in water, which makes water cleaner um, than compared to cattle, where cattle are mucking it up and disturbing it quite a bit. Um, bison also can travel further distances from water, so they don't uh, they aren't so dependent on spending time around watering holes um, and therefore move a lot more um, throughout the pasture as they graze so they don't need to keep coming back to the same spot. Um, they can travel pretty much throughout the whole pasture um, th in a day and then kind of ra roundaboutly come back to the watering hole um, to get a drink. So um, in that way they're really efficient. Um, and speaking of efficiency, we Tim mentioned that we can we have these bison on the landscape year round. Um, that's without supplemental feed, because bison actually reduce their metabolism um, in the winter time and can forage on the uh, the not green plants, the senesc plants, um, and still gain the nu nutrient needs that they have. And what's amazing is that's when they are um, developing their fetus calf and will um, you know will get birth in the following spring so really they're even getting enough nutrients to supply that calf um, and successfully develop that calf so um, some people talk about the bison advantage and that's just one
So we're about to show you a uh, footage of the watering hole that is the in inner pasture watering hole that uh, Josh was referring to earlier.
So we have a question here from Matt about the bison's fur. So yeah, they just shed one time a year. Um, sometimes that shed can take a little bit longer than others. Um, but one way they do shed is by doing this wallowing behavior that you can see in the shot here. So they'll kind of roll on their backs and uh, create a divot in the ground of bare soil. Um, they do this for several reasons besides um, just shedding their fur. They do it to coat their fur with um, dust, which helps them pr helps protect them from the heat the heat of the sun, and it also helps them protect from uh, from insect bites. Um, and then they also do it as a way to scratch themselves. And then sometimes they wallow as a sign as a sign of aggression or um, to show dominance between bulls. So a lot of times, what you'll see is a bull come up and wallow in a wallow and he will um, urinate in it and then you'll see another bull come up and do some grunting and step into the wallow and kind of do the same thing so that's kind of just a display of dominance um, in, the, in the pasture. So wallowing is kind of unique to bison. Um, cattle do wallow a little bit but not to the extent or degree or the magnitude that bison do. So as if you look across our bison pastures um, from an aerial view you'll actually see these wallows. Um, they really focus on the uh, ridges um, and they're kind of dotted all along our sandy ridges, ridge swale system here. Um, and they really prefer to use those areas to loaf around in and hang out in. Um, and that uh, behavior and that uh, disturbance effect is really important because it opens up ground space for um, new forbs to establish. Um, forbs like milkweed really like to establish on bare ground soil, so um, they help promote the establishment of new milkweeds in those wallows and around those wallows. We did a study a few years ago looking at wallows and found that the vegetation that comes back in those wallows um, is just as much native stuff as there is um, on the outside of those wallows. There are just different, uh, different species in there. So we actually see some species that occur in those wallows um, that don't occur on the outside. So really um, those native plants have been waiting around in the soil bank um, waiting to um, to be released by that disturbance activity like wallowing. So we have a question about whether males stay with the herd throughout the year or not. And actually, uh, they are like other plains animals. The males will segregate themselves into uh, bachelor herds or by themselves. Uh, and then they usually come back to the cow herd, cow and calf herd, during the rut, during the mating season. Um, they will stay with the herd for quite a while uh, once all the breeding is done or they feel like that they've uh, either been pushed around too much or they're done breeding uh, they will leave the herd at that time and they they tend to uh, spend a lot of time by themselves throughout the year It is usually about this time of year where we'll start seeing the breeding bulls coming back to the herd. Younger bulls will stay with the cows for a while until uh, they start reaching maturity before they uh, start to leave on their own. So usually in mid-July to August, sometime in there where the cows start uh, coming into season, the bulls will start returning and that's when you see most of the fighting between bulls 
four dominance and breeding rights. Josh could probably speak more to this about bulls breeding, but uh, we do see some of the younger, uh, less dominant bulls will actually breed some of the cows. Um, the reason for this could be uh, lots of things, but I think Josh has probably got some insight into that that I'll let him speak to. But yes, the bulls will come back to the herd generally once a year and spend most of the time by themselves. So yeah, like Tim said, the male bison, uh, the d most dominant b bull, will uh, generally tend to do the most breeding, or the most dominant couple bulls will tend to do the most breeding, and um, every once in a while, a male, a uh, younger male, or less dominant male will sneak in, um, but we actually studied um, using their genetics and some behavior uh, uh, examinations, looking and actually watching the bison make breeding attempts, kind of found out that um, there's actually a hierarchical structure to the even the breeding cycles, so or th to who gets to breed. So the top males kind of breed the top and mid-ranking females, whereas the middle-ranking males males breed the middle-ranking and low-ranking females. Um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, the uh, a lot of times the males, the big dominant males, will uh, experience what's called stress of dominance. So at, during breeding season, they're always being challenged by uh, by other males. So that most dominant male, he's like the king of the mountain trying to stay on top. Um, that causes a huge amount of stress on them and um, a huge amount of energy need. So that rut actually gets the hormones kind of pumping in these bull bison and they actually reduce their metabolism during this period as well. Um, sometimes they won't eat the whole month of, um, of of the end of July and, and into April or August because of the rut is that got their adrenaline and cortisol levels so high. Um, so staying on top for that long is almost impossible for a whole month. So as that big dominant bull gets tired or he, um, he might become weaker and might lose a battle to another bull or those or just be tired of defending off those females and um, and eventually a, a younger bull will sneak in. As we mentioned, um, we track those genetics and we actually can track who is um, the father and who is the mother of each calf that's born here at the Crane Trust. Um, we use that information to help us decide when we need to bring in new bulls from other herds. We uh, also use it to help us decide when a bull has had enough opportunities, say if he stays dominant in the herd for several years or is the dominant breeder for seven years, his genetics are well represented at that point and we maybe we'll consider letting him, um, moving those bison around and letting another bull or other bulls naturally move up through the hierarchy and try to get that chance to breed and again help us meet our genetic diversity goals. So we have a question coming in from Geneva, Illinois, um, asking where the herd is located. So um, Tim had mentioned that the herd has access, um, at least through different parts of the year, to about 1,200 acres of uh, contiguous um, and mostly relic prairie. Um, here, um, right off the exit 305, that was the ALDA exit on Interstate I-80 in South Central Nebraska. So if you've ever traveled Interstate 80 through Nebraska, you've definitely drove by our bison herd in the last, um, well, since 2015 when the bison first got here. We actually have our herd split up into two herds. So we have the larger herd, um, which is um, on the south side of the north channel of the Platte River. 
and we have a smaller herd up at the visitor center that serves as more of an education herd um, and allows us to um, give viewers and people even passing by an interstate uh, a chance to see bison um, and uh, it's been exciting uh, we had a comment last night from somebody who specifically said that their membership to the crane trust was to support or help support this herd and that's a reminder that um, we cannot do this great conservation work here at the Crane Trust without you as members and I want to thank you um, probably not the first thank you you'll get tonight but thank you for tuning in and being members Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, we have a lot more footage for you here tonight. Um, we are going to look uh, in a few minutes at what Mallory Beckman does. M it is Mallory's birthday today. She's not with us here in the studio. However, she did help with quite a bit of this footage by taking uh, me around in a four-wheeler uh, to get closer to Bison than I would have been able to get with my SUV. I greatly appreciate all the work she puts in, not only to helping uh, the virtual bison, bison program, but also to helping the bison team here uh, manage the land well for the bison and the other species we have here at Crane Trust. So in a few minutes, we will be looking at uh, a clip of Mallory taking us around in the field and have her talk a little bit about her experience and her experience raising a baby calf. So hang tight for that. Uh, we're currently getting it ready. So just a reminder, what you are about to hear from Mallory is a pre-recording, so she will not be here to answer any questions. But once again, let's wish her a very happy birthday. My name is Mallory Beckman and I am a land management technician here at the Crane Trust. Um, do a lot of fencing maintenance and spraying of invasive species. I think my favorite thing 
about being a technician here at the Crane Trust is getting to work closely with the bison herd that we have here. Usually every day I come out here and I check on the bison, check to see if we have any new calves, see how their health is, if they have hoof rot or pink eye, and then I will treat them for that. Um, I will usually drive out here either with a truck or a ranger and I will check the calves, see if there's any limping going on. Um, I will also look for new calves, which they're pretty easy to spot now since a lot of them are bigger and I will document those in my notes. We had 43 calves this year. I think we are done calving for this year. One of the main challenges that sticks out to me is keeping our herd healthy without interfering too much with them. Um, we do some darting for hoof rot and 
if our calves aren't getting better, we do have to come back out and re-administer the antibiotics for them. So just monitoring them and making sure they're okay. So we had a question about the gray-maned bison. So um, <laughs> as bison uh, age, uh, that, that one he saw was a female, so she had lost her horn, horn caps. As females age, or as bison age, they tend to um, lose some of the luster in their fur coats. Um, and also as they um, kind of get a closer to shedding and in the spring and early summer, they will also have a duller kind of sheen to their coat rather than that bright um, dark brown as we are used to seeing. The most interesting story and probably my favorite story is last year during the summertime I got to hand feed a baby bison after his mom passed away. It was something that I have never really experienced before. I did grow up with cattle so I knew what that was like, but a bison was totally different. Um, it was actually really cool. The guys would try to get the little calf to eat and he would never eat until I came in the trailer and tried to feed him and he ate right away from me. So I got to be his mom for the summer. One thing that was really difficult is that I had to come out every couple hours and feed him. I did get very attached to him and it was hard when we let him out into the herd, but when I come out here and check them, I always check on him and I call his name and we named him Harry and he'll always look over at me. So I think he remembers me. Harry is a little over a year old. Harry is doing very well. Yes, he's very healthy.
I am Mallory Beckman and thank you for joining our virtual tour. Hi everyone, um, this is Kylie. Thank you so much for uh, watching that with us. Uh, we really appreciate Mallory's work. And once again, Mallory, happy birthday. One of the things that we uh, talk about quite a bit at the Crane Trust is the fact that uh, when we're helping the cranes, we're also helping the other species uh, that live in the area. And this of course also applies to bison. Uh, we do have a segment that's about to come up where we will be showing you some of the other species we've been filming throughout the summer. Uh, I'm going to have Josh, before he leaves, um, jump on and talk a little bit about bi bison coexisting with all of these other species. And, and then we'll bid him adieu for the night and we'll have a look at what we captured. So without further ado, here is Josh. So as I mentioned, you know, bison uh, created variable levels of disturbance um, with their movement patterns around the Great Plains. There was something between 30 and 60 million bison on the Great Plains um, at the end of or the middle of the 1800s. Um, and what that what happened was is that the plains evolved with this bison grazing and so did all of these species that occur there um, with that bison grazing now that calf you can see the brown-headed cowbirds that are behind him picking up um, insects at as um, they gather around the bison um, or they are attracted to the fecal matter the bison deposit So bison are thought to graze um, largely on the grasses, and that's really important because they are knocking back um, that dense cover of grasses to allow um, room for plants like these great or these blue verveins that you saw in the clip there. Um, and uh, so they're knocking back that vegetation, creating open ground space for these forbs to flourish. And as these forbs flourish, so do the pollinators that use those forbs, um, so pollinators like the regal fritillary and monarch butterflies that we have here in abundance, um, and all the native species of bees and moths, um, even flies that are insect or that are pollinators. And as these pollinators pollinate the plants that the bison have made room for, um, that creates seed, and those seeds provide an abundance of food resources for the birds that exist here, birds like goldfinches that um, really thrive and need those seeds. Those th seeds stay on some plants throughout the winter, um, and are even here in the spring when birds get back here, so um, providing a year-round resource for all of those wildlife species. As bison prefer to graze in certain areas like this one here where he's keeping or they are keeping the vegetation short, some species like the upland sandpiper um, really prefer that shorter vegetation. Other species like grasshopper sparrows also prefer that short vegetation and meadowlarks, while others prefer um, a little bit taller vegetation and there's certain areas that bison don't prefer to graze in or at least not during the growing season. Um, providing refugee refugia for um, uh, birds like the bobolink um, who prefer taller vegetation and wetlands where bison are not grazing. 
all of these levels there with disturbance uh, are important because um, each species we have here has a particular niche um, and preference along the prairie. So our ideal level of management is to provide as many different habitat types as we can and then as many different disturbance levels um, from no disturbance at all to heavy disturbance in some places to provide all those niche variables. So even though we have a little more footage coming, Kylie's going to go ahead and finish out the program with you guys. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, joining you here for our bi bison virtual tour. Um, and again, I just wanted to thank all of you guys out there for your support of the Crane Trust um, throughout the years. And if you're new members, welcome. Um, we really uh, could not do this without you. Um, all of these bison and the flowers and the plants and the birds and the mammals they all depend on this habitat and our protection so we couldn't protect it and keep doing those wonderful things that we do without you um, this is josh weesey range manager with the crane trust signing off thank you again Thank you so much, Josh, for that rundown of all those wonderful species that benefit so much from our bison. We really appreciate Josh's insight. He's uh, taught us a great deal, has taught me a great deal while I've been here. So with Josh leaving, I hope that I'll be able to answer some of your questions as well, although I don't have quite his expertise as we go into some of these other clips about what other species have been enjoying their summer here at the Crane Trust. If you happen to know a thing or two about bison, birds, or pollinators, feel free to drop comments in the comment section and participate as we move along through this journey.
So we'll start off with the red-winged blackbird. Uh, this is a bird that spends a great deal of time um, around Nebraska and pretty much the United States. It has a wide range. Uh, just so you know, we will be showing you some footage of some other species, but we are going back to bison to finish off the night. This is also a red-winged blackbird. It's a uh, red and yellow patch isn't as quite profound. It could be an older bird or it's quite possibly still developing those colors. Uh, this bobwhite, uh, apologies for the little bit of a head cut off there. Uh, this bobwhite is a uh, bobwhite that was hanging out the patio window of the place where I'm staying here at Crane Trust. Uh, bobwhite quails are uh, quite uh, prolific around here. They have a little uh, call that goes. We're all about rivers here, and the kingfisher is a uh, river-loving bird. One of the cooler things happening this uh, summer is uh, two killdeer have decided to lay a nest right outside our headquarters building. Uh, they're very protective of their young. Um, and they do work together to uh, keep their nest uh, on the mend. Uh, one of the interesting things is they do this sort of broken wing activity when they feel threatened uh, to draw predators away from the nest. It's very sacrificial and I find it very heartbreaking to watch, but it is as the killdeer do and they do it to protect their young. Uh, they work in teams. Sometimes they even have two nests going at once. Here you can see a little changing of the guard happening. Uh, these killdeer uh, have gotten kind of acclimated to us as long as we just walk past them without bothering them, but they, they still do kind of shy away from groups and we're doing our best not to disturb them as they currently shed their uh, shade over the eggs when it's hot or keep them warm when it is cool. This was captured on a mixture of GoPro and long lens cameras. You can see the eggs are kind of got spots on them as the killdeer starts to sit on them. Our beautiful herons are quite often mistaken as cranes by people who don't know the difference. Uh, they're actually not related as a species. Uh, they're very distant from each other. But these herons, this is a great blue heron here preening, uh, uh, have been seen in groups of two and three on the river as of lately. And here's just a collection of clips of other species we have seen throughout the summer. This fawn was actually seen last night.
Bobo link. Regal Fritillary. beautiful fawn again. Fireflies. So we, we hope you enjoyed that little collection of clips and we hope to uh, just remind everyone how important these species are when they work together, how, how important it is that they work together in this cohabitation.
agree. I, I love seeing the fireflies. It is one of the uh, neatest things to witness at night. As we talk about night, I am about to show you our last clip for the evening. Um, if you have any final questions, please feel free to drop them in the comments. We really appreciate you being with us for our very first bison mm -hmm. virtual tour. If you do have any feedback at all, uh, please email virtual at cranetrust.org. We'll happily look at it. We are trying to build this program and enrich it as we come up with new ideas on what kind of virtual content to bring you. Uh, you've seen a live format with our prairie chickens and our cranes, and now we've brought you a pre-recorded format. So if there's uh, uh, something you like about either, please feel free to share it with us.
As I look at these images, I can't help but think of the uh, great American savanna uh, that it, many naturalists refer to this area as with the plains and then the sparse trees poking up here and there. And if you look closely, you will see some fireflies popping up around these uh, baby bison in the grass.
So with that, I would like to thank you all for joining our virtual bison tour and for participating in all the various questions and comments. The fireflies were live recorded footage and not time lapse. I also want to thank you all for being uh, Crane Trust members. Without your support, we would not be able to do what we do. We greatly appreciate your support, and we wish uh, to continue that relationship because we need to protect and maintain the physical, hydrological, and biological integrity of the Big Bend area. Uh, this is really important for all of our species who rely on this uh, Platte River area as a life support system. It is a support system for so many species, as Josh discussed earlier today. It is a support system for whooping cranes, sandhill cranes, boba whites, boba lynx, herons, killdeer, all kinds of moths and insects and butterflies including our regal fritillaries and our monarchs and our fireflies, uh, great numerous species of grasslands, and of course the great American bison who has been the star of our program tonight. Please stay tuned on our social media channels for updates on future virtual programs as we will be bringing them to you in the future. Once again, thank you all for your support and for your participation, and this is Kylie Warren signing off. Have a lovely night.